Blaring Out Show. This is the Blaring Out Show with Eric Blair with Keith Emerson of Emerson Lake and Palmer. How you doing today, Keith? Wonderful. How you doing? Excellent. What were your earliest musical influences? Ooh. I think Floyd Kramer, actually, and uh, Seb, he passed away. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he was a very uh, big influence. Um, he was one of those few piano players that could get into the, into the, the hip parade. Um, you, you have to understand when I was growing up in England that, um, you know, and I didn't have a, a record player, and we were, I got my influences by what I heard through the radio. And, uh, and the radio stations would only play the, the, the hit records. So, um, and obviously I'd listened to keyboard players that, that, that played and uh, I remember Floyd Kramer had um, a single called On The Rebound which would just knock me out. <clears throat> and I, then I think I had it was uh, Bee Bumble and the Stingers, Nut Rocker, that was, uh, that was a bit of fun because I was playing classical music at the time. And uh, he had another way around, um, you know, he had a way of making it fun. So after that I just sort of like uh, experimented with some of the classical pieces with, that I was playing with, you know, at the time. Give us some background of the years leading up to the formation of the Nice. Well I actually started um, with a band called the T-Bones and they were a blues band working in London and around England and whenever Blues artists like Sonny Boy Williamson would come from America. Uh, the T-Bones were, were the backing band. And we used to back T-Bone Walker as well. So my, my earliest experiences were with, really with the blues. Um, and after the T-Bones, I was with the, uh, a band called the VIPs and uh, then went on to form my own band which actually was the start of the progressive era, I suppose. A band called The Nice. What are your greatest memories from The Nice? Oh boy. You should read my book on that. It's, um, I have a lot of memories. Uh, none I can go into now. <laughs> Walk us through your first contact with Greg Lake and Carl Palmer in the formation of ELP. I met Greg Lake in San Francisco, Fillmore West, December, 17th, 1969, and it was at a time when I was writing and composing music that uh, I needed a singer that really was an extension of my keyboard play, and uh, well, that's kind of a demanding thing, really. But um, and yeah, it, it caused a fair degree of tension, <clears throat> as it still does. Um, but, uh, no, you know, DLP was ELP, and uh, we, uh, uh, our first gig was at the Isle of Wight Festival. Uh, we found Carl Palmer, actually, after, uh, well, obviously before the Isle of Wight Festival, but we found him. Uh, after trying out several other drummers, Mitch Mitchell, none of them worked out, and Carl j just fitted in, you know, perfectly with us. You didn't set out thinking we're going to put this super group together. No, I, I wanted to work with the with the best people, and um, there were very few uh, bass players in England at that time that could actually sing and play the bass guitar, and Greg was one of those few. Uh, musicians that could play bass, sing, and also play acoustic guitar. So that was a plus factor. I wanted to keep the whole thing as a as a three-piece band. I, I like the flexibility of just three people playing and improvising together. And Carl had that technique. Um, he was very schooled in the art of percussion and also in the art of uh, playing the the. the the drum set. So it was um, 
yeah. we all bounced ideas off of each other. We were very competitive. Mm -hmm. Well, we still are competitive, yeah. I suppose. Um, and those things can can produce fireworks, and they, they did. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, attributes a lot of your success, is that the combustibility of all the members of ELP creating this fire, an explosion. Would you agree? Boy, you said it. <laughs> How close was Jimi Hendrix to being in, to joining ELP? I toured with Jimmy in, uh, when was it, 69, I think, no, no, 68. Uh, I, I then had my band, The Nice, and um, Jimmy was, was topping the bill. I think other bands on that bill were The, the Move, there was also The Pink Floyd. I mean, if you can believe this, that, you know, or, or you come with, with one ticket that costs like 15 shillings, which would probably be about two dollars today. You saw Jimi Hendrix, you saw Pink Floyd, The Move, The Nice, Air Apparent, and a whole lot of other other bands. And uh, I got to know Jimmy during that time, and uh, during Soundcheck, he'd come up and, and we'd play a bit. There was a club in London called the Speakeasy Club, and uh, we, we played there, jam there once. But uh, he was, he, he was uh, inspirational, I think, because I, I really had, I wanted to do the same thing um, with, with the Hammond. As, well, I was actually doing the same yeah. thing with the, with the Hammond, uh, but we, we kind of, I think we observed each other from a, from a distance. You know. but, uh, I read this book by John McDermott that um, he, uh, interviewed Chaz Chandler, which was uh, Jimmy's manager, and uh, it turned out that uh, Jimmy had won wanted me to play on his album Axis Bold as Love. Mm -hmm. When I read that, I went, oh God, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> you know? But uh, I think he was, he was basically a very shy person. He just went out and did whatever he wanted to do, and he didn't even tell Mitchell or Noel Redding uh, a lot of what he did. He'd go on television shows and just break into whatever he felt like doing. And uh, But uh, he was very lucky to have uh, two good guys behind him that could follow him. I don't think any, any production today can compare with the production on those, e those early ELP records. They're in your face, they're punchy, they're pounding. I mean, what was your secret to, to you know, making that happen in the studio? No, no secret, just, um, it was dreadful, really. Although Greg Lake was credited with being the producer, we all had our hands on the faders over our own in individual instruments, and we'd be pushing them up to the top of the, the, the desk, wanting to uh, get it louder and louder and louder, and the engineer would just be getting the master fader and just dipping it and dipping it, and we'd be pushing it higher. So it was really, it wasn't the, the right way to go about it. It was, everybody wanted to hear his own instrument and it, uh, no, there wasn't one person there wanting to hear the whole homogenous thing, you know, combined. Yeah. It was, uh, we were just, as I said before, we were three very, we are three very individual, competitive people. And it's not the good way to, to produce an album these days. I mean, it, it was on a wing and a prayer we got these albums out, really, without bottling each other and getting into huge fights. Now um, I'm going to let my brother come in here for and ask a couple questions of you, Keith. Right. So, Evan, did you ever get to meet Aaron Copeland? Aaron Copeland. Um, I had communication with him uh, and correspondence, which uh, um, he was a, obviously a very big influence of mine. Uh, going back to when we played Hoedown the first time. And then we, um, it was actually his third symphony, Copeland's third symphony, which r really impressed me, and p particularly the, the, the last movement where he uses the, uh, 
the fanfare for the common man. And I was very enlightened to, to, to find out that in fact Copeland had written 10 fanfares and he'd chosen the fanfare for the common man for the last movement of his uh, third symphony. And um, it was a it was a piece of music that that, that ELP, that Greg Carl and myself really loved. I mean, and um, it was and I worked out an arrangement very simply. It was just uh, a shuffle in the bass and uh, and just playing the fanfare thing, and then an improvisation in the middle, and then back to the to the fanfare. And we did a a very a one-off recording when we went to uh, Montreux, Switzerland. Somebody set up a stereo microphone, and that's how the way it was recorded. And we just jammed the whole thing off like that and, and I'd forgotten about the recording until we got into making uh, the um, Works Volume 1 album and we dug this tape out after we I'd done my piano concerto and pirates and everything like that. So it was it was like an afterthought then? It was an afterthought. Uh, it was Greg that, that, that dug it out of the vault and put it on the turntable when Ahmed Ertigan uh, the Atlantic Records uh, president was there to listen, and he he played it to uh, to Ahmed. I said, "What are you playing this for? It's like it's just recorded on a stereo mic." <laughs> and uh, well, that was that was the way it turned out. Robert Plant has said to call Cashmere the definitive Led Zeppelin track. What would you consider the definitive ELP track, and would it be Carnival Nine? Ooh, <clears throat> I've, there's a lot of speculation on that. Um, out of all the albums that we've done, I mean, some say pictures an exhibition, some say the f first album. What do uh, you like? What I, I like them all. I like them all. Uh, I think, in a way, brain cell surgery was was at the pinnacle. It was it was right before. <clears throat> I went into orchestration. It, it was the band uh, Balls to the Wall, if you can call it that way. We, we'd overcome our uh, writer's block with dealing with each other, with, with uh, learning to to share ideas, and, and it was a, we were at a very receptive period. And as a result, it, it was a fun thing to do. Um, it was it was it was a fun album. The, the first DLP album was hard to make. The second album, we almost split the band on. Um, that, that was Tarkus. Correct? Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, because I was writing stuff that uh, the band looked at me and said, "No, I'm not playing that. It's crazy." So I said, "Well, then fine. I'll go on my own." What is your opinion on British pop bands, Oasis, and I, I don't listen to uh, British pop bands. You really, you don't listen to any. No, unless it's. Yeah, are you hear. really are you really into like classical music? Is that what you listen no, to? No, no. What? no, I mean, I think that there's a place for it. There's a place for Oasis. There's a place for the Spice Girls. I mean, I like the Spice Girls. I think they're fun, uh, and there's room for funny music. I love having funny music, uh, but uh, you know, I'm not in a position to comment on it. How did uh, the ELP record with Cozy Powell come about? Uh, Greg Lake and I, we had a solo deal, and Polygram wanted us to go on tour with it. Carl was with Asia. We wanted a drummer. Cozy Powell was available. Cozy came in, and we and then that was it. And we played. And Cozy did a very good job, by the way. Yeah, he did. Brilliant. That's a good album. Keith, it's been so good having you on the show. Thank you so much for Thank your you time. Too. This is the Blaring Out Show with Eric Blair with Keith Emerson signing off. The Blaring Out Show.